great. Thank you. Welcome to Oz Live STEAM Math and Modeling. We're very thankful to our sponsors and supporters for making this new event possible. And we're excited to see who is interested in e-learning, seeing math and modeling. So if you can click and drag where you are from, that would be great. I know we're trying to make some connections between the United States and Australia, and we look to see these connections growing. Wonderful. And we specifically want to thank our sponsors and uh, Steve Targarden, Lucy Gray, Ness Crouch, Coach Carroll, and also Peggy. So here we go. This is actually the story of a global collaboration between Next.cc and Lumifold. So here we are. Melissa, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, everybody. My name's Melissa Silk. I'm a, a STEAM instructor, STEAM innovator at International Grammar School, which is an independent school in um, in Ultimo in Sydney. Um, I have a number of different um, sort of titles uh, in in my role, um, but mainly I'm focusing on embedding the arts into STEM education at my school and also uh, within other organizations and other schools. And I'm Lindsay you. you may have participated in my session yesterday and I'm an which is naturally a STEAM professional in practice, very integrated. I also teach, and today I'm here with Melissa because of the next step to the media. Melissa and I met, and we found that both of our organizations were doing parallel things, and we decided to team up. So you're going to learn about LumaFold and her STEAM pop zone and next step CC and how e-learning can support hands on making. So this is really, we actually met via staff and shared what we were both doing and then Melissa came over to the U.S. and gave a workshop with students, Chicago Public School students, in January last month. And that's what we're going to share with you today. So we'll start with a short video. It's just under 30 seconds. And I think Ness can put this, um, Ness and I can put this link in. There we go. It's right here. Coach Carol has a question there, Linda. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, Linda. I'm hearing uh, feedback, and I think it's because there's two mics open, so I'm not sure whose. So could we have one speaker, one one microphone on? Sure. Please? Absolutely. So I'll we'll pass it back and forth, Melissa. Let me finish this. I'm hoping people uh, raise your hand if you're watching this short video introducing STEM as science, technology, engineering, and math. And then in the U.S., we are adding, obviously, art for STEAM, but also E for the environment. And we actually are then sharing, through e-learning, integrated activities for teachers and students to connect STEAM in place-based projects, right, in their school and their school community. So I'm hoping now you had a chance to see the video. You can watch it later. You'll have the link. But we want to explain the idea of e-learning as a support for directed instruction in the classroom with the support of actual physical modeling, which is really Melissa's contribution with LumaFold. And then the 
potential, the powerful potential of e-learning to continue kind of horizontally expand the learning with global career connections after this experience. So you'll see that as we go through the steps of this workshop that we'll be pointing out things, uh, activities from NEXT that can help prime math and modeling in this specific instance. E-learning is an amazing resource for teachers and students to learn about things in advance. So you'll see today, we are going to actually suggest that students look at the pattern journey, which we're researching right now, nature pattern. Melissa will talk about biomimicry. We will be incorporating geometry. Melissa will talk about symmetry. We're going to be creating form out of a piece of paper. So of course, paper is a subject that can be integrated when teaching math. We'll be looking at the art of paper folding and paper engineering. And we'll actually be constructing lights, which are a surprise, with the same principles that even things as large as architecture can be constructed. So I'm going to turn off and pass this over to Melissa. OK. I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Um, the three main um, focus areas of the Lumifold project are, are steep in biomimicry, symmetry, and iteration. And those, those are the three words that I use when I'm teaching this unit um, or this project as either an extended, prolonged project or a two-hour or three-hour workshop. So biomimicry is, um, is, of course, the way that we use design to mimic nature. And we learn from nature, obviously, and adapt to best ideas, as you can see. Um, this is not a new thing. This has been happening for a long time, although I guess what's happening in education is that the links have not been so, uh, uh, not been so predominantly focused on. And I think it's important now that we do this earlier rather than later in, uh, in our design and art journey so that we can understand how we do relate. Um, to, uh, to nature in a much more uh, significant way. Um, let's go to the next one. This is uh, obviously uh, back to NEXT. There's a biomimicry uh, project in NEXT that, that is about is linked to this uh, Lumisol project as well as our paper modeling and all of the journeys that Linda's been talking about. Um, there are several um, online activities that you can do there. And there, there's also a great amount of resource on the on the web related to biomimicry. And I think some of those um, are, are in the next couple of slides or they're coming up. So Ask Nature is one of them, I know. So these are, these are the activities that are explored in, in next uh, journeys. But I, I would like particularly to point you to the resources that are available for helping students to understand this wonderful area. And the Biomimicry Institute, which is the Biomimicry 3.8 that you can see on the screen, it's fabulous. It's a really, really clear kind of way to understand the way that we use nature in, in our art and design and in our understanding of, of all of the, the things that we produce as human beings. So it's, um, it's really wonderful. And there's a whole bunch of things that you can explore on that. So I think I'm going back to you now, Linda. Thanks, Melissa. That was kind of a walkthrough of how a journey works. They show the scales and the subjects that that journey applies to. And then there are three to ten activities that integrate science, technology, engineering, the environment, art, and math. And students, if you see little camera, students have uploaded work to a digital gallery. And then there is a short uh, review of five multiple choice just to give students an idea to see if they're learning the vocabulary. And then by teacher request, the idea, well, the students finish this, what is next? And so that's where we get the relate journeys. And the relate actually then link back into the site and say, well, if you like biomimicry, you might like nature patterns down here, or you might like nanotechnology, or you really might want to look at 
the pattern journey or systems thinking. So it kind of extends that endless loop of learning. Melissa. Okay. Um, one of the one of the people that we'd like to have a look at when we're exploring biomimicry and design um, at the outset of any of these journeys is a, a woman working in Melbourne called Leah Heiss. She works uh, specifically with a, she's the artist in residence with some biomedical companies, and she works on creating um, really aesthetic products that are related to real, uh, uh, biomedic medicine. Um, and she works at all levels, both the nano and uh, uh, you know, a real size. And this particular project is called Seed Sensor, and I think it's a, a wonderful example to show students of the way um, the nanotechnology can use uh, biomimicry in terms of its design for the release of information within a human body at a really small scale. So I like students to explore that when they're continuously the subject. And I see I left my mic on. Apologies, Melissa, but her work is absolutely amazing. And this is part of what the STEAM approach can do. It can take that directed instruction of learning about math in the classroom and connect it to artists, scientists, environmentalists, designers. And it really shows that possibilities of what you're learning are actually endless, as Melissa will tell you in this slide. It's, uh, it's sometimes difficult for students to understand some of the words that, that are delivered when you're talking about biomimicry in a nano um, context. So um, I'd like to include these, these examples because they show the story of form. And so the, the bat wing and the small drone are, are related in the way that they unfold. And in this way, in this particular project, we also introduce the idea of folding having come from nature, as well as being a mathematical element. So it's in, and, and at this point, I think when we present this type of work, students have the aha moment when they can really make those connections between what's going on in nature and how that's applied in design for a, a specific purpose or for, or for an identified need. So here's the Ask Nature. Um, we can both talk, Melissa, but it's the Ask Nature site that was actually created by the Biomimicry Foundation, founded by Janine Venice. Um, definitely linked in both nature patterns and in biomimicry. And what you can do is you ask any question, how does nature land on water? How does nature um, create a net? And it will give you different functions for that question, and then those functions will be answered by plants, animals, insects, molecular <laughs> constructions. It's an amazingly powerful site. Thank you. Thank you for putting that. It is ama an amazing site, and when, when students have explored that type of, or those types of activities or that type of information, what I like to do is to bring it back to the 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 uh, specifics of folding and applied folding in this sense. Um, now these two examples that we've, we've got in front of you now are uh, from, uh, one is from biomedicine as well for um, the delivery of information to um, developing nations and the, the one on the right is actually a model for the paper, for the, the folded structure that is sent into space also to deliver information. So here we see folding as a, a device that can deliver very small amounts of information or, or a lot of information at a very small level or um, a significant amount of information at a very large level, but the point of departure is that the items are small and unfold. So we're beginning to really sort of drill down into the folding journey at this point, still relating it back to biomimicry. And I think, Melissa, this is a great example of when we met and began to collaborate, though Next and its researchers have found about 10,000 of the world's best links and sorted them topically, these were new links because teachers all over the world have access to different creatives. 
and to share this innovation is really, really amazing. Um, I think the question that's asking, what age group do you usually work with in these projects? And I think both Melissa and I should answer that question. Um, my group actually was, uh, next was actually aimed at middle school because that's the, the age and the school level that needs the most support in the United States right now. But it actually is being used from third graders up to college students. And so I think that there are levels for introducing these things. I'm going to let Melissa um, give her input on that question as well. I agree. Uh, the, the, there are different levels where you can introduce the idea of biomimicry in, in, um, in design and in art or in project work. And I think what you need to do in terms of scalability is to allow for the different levels of understanding, of course, from, say, third graders right up to, um, to university students. And so you would have to structure how you deliver these types of projects. Typically, to answer your question, I think middle school is the best place to focus on this type of work because that's when students in Australia, at any rate, are making decisions about what it is that they're going to choose for their senior years of study. And I really think that having wonderful explorations like this encourages more students to see the relationships between the science, technology, engineering, and math um, subjects and enables them to think, well, I, I needn't be so scared because there are many and varied applications of this type of understanding in, um, in my in study, in further study. And so perhaps you're breaking down the barriers that, it's so, that STEM is analytical all the time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about symmetry now being where we head to after the biomimicry exploration in any one of these projects. We head into the mathematics of the project and symmetry is a very important aspect. And this is the definition which you can read for yourself. This is um, also linked to one of the next journeys in symmetry. Um, when we, we like to sort of explore symmetry in a way that there's a discovery or there's a notion out there that uh, human beings find um, absolute symmetry quite boring. Um, so symmetry plus complexity, still being in a symmetrical format, just introduces a little bit of a different, uh, I guess, uh, journey for one's brain. And in this particular project of Lumifold, the glide reflection creates the complexity which makes the symmetry not boring for this project. And that's what we did together when we were explaining in, um, in Chicago. Back to you, Linda. Thanks, Melissa. Um, symmetry is found in nature, it's found in our own bodies, and it's found in much of the built environment. And it's a basic uh, vocabulary introduction of how to explain types of symmetry. And one of the funniest, I think, science fair uh, exhibits is where you, with Photoshop, take a picture of people's faces and then you take a half and mirror it. And it just brings about all kinds of laughter because we are actually, though we call ourselves um, bilaterally symmetrical, we actually, our faces and our bodies are asymmetrical. But I just want to back in here for a moment, Linda, with that, with that, sure. that, that project that we were just talking about. I think um, mm -hmm. I've, I've run that project of the, the asymmetrical reflection symmetry with a number of students at, at many different age levels, and they find it fascinating. It's a really good one to run. It just it, it, it just opens up so many conversations and allows for so much understanding about about the, the concept of symmetry and asymmetry. Excellent. That, I mean, it is. It just peels of laughter. And I think this is another good example of how e-learning can take a simple, what's known, taught. It's taught in composition and art, but as a math topic, and it shows how it touches buildings. It comes in nature, in things that we create, and that actually it can evolve and become part of a purpose in life for someone or a project. 
I like to uh, link some of the ideas that we've spoken about in terms of biomimicry and symmetry um, and iteration being a repetition, but linking it back to this woman's work. She's a, an architect, Anapama Kundu, and she works with the specific types of folds that we can work with in the Lumifold project. Um, there are many and varied ways that we can fold paper to have a structure that is stable. But she works um, particularly for disaster prone areas or just, uh, after disasters in developing nations to create these structures which have um, stability and strength. They're made of ferrocement. They're able to be shipped in at, a, at a, um, a flat pack type of situation and constructed very simply, as you'll see in the picture, by one or two um, human beings just unfolding, putting the, the structure up, and away you go. You have shelter. So these real world examples of folding and biomimicry with the um, inherent mathematics are very important for students to relate to or to engage with because that allows them for a greater understanding. Finally, um, go it, 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 well, I'd just like to say that iteration is, is a buzzword. It's been a, a buzzword around uh, in design for a long time, but people are now using iteration, the word iteration in the vernacular in general conversation. And basically, it's, it's a repetition, a repetition with slight changes, this sort of thing. And it, it, it has the intention of making whatever it is that you started with better each time that you progress. Over to you, Linda. OK, great. Um, the iterative process is really, really key. Um, it builds somewhat like it builds kind of attention and focus, but it also implies that there is evaluation and reflection. And I think that Iteration needs to be introduced in a lot of different ways, and I think you'll find how it's introduced in this paper folding project pretty fascinating. It, it is fascinating, and when when you start to look at the the way that uh, origamists work, uh, you actually can plot and plan before you fold a piece of paper by using mathematics alone. But for this simple glide reflection, which is the iterative shape and pattern that we use in the Lumifold project, the, the formula for um, gliding and reflecting can be described in the diagram that you see on the screen now. And it's basically a translation, which is a mathematical um, terminology or term. And you, you, where you have a glide, you, you glide, you reflect over a line or an axis and then you move a certain distance along. So the line of reflection always has to be parallel to the direction of the translation. So that allows for the symmetry that we've been talking about to be accurate. Um, so we don't, so we, there's no rotation in this. It's just a translation or a reflection and then a translation, which is generally termed as a movement along the line. And that uh, mathematically, as you can see here, is called commutative transformation. Big words, but a very simple concept. And uh, well, this really is amazing because it's a way of learning how to see something. Instead of looking at it and not understanding it, it's a type of literacy. And it actually begins in this paper that is, comes from Lumifold. And students are handed a piece of paper. And as an aside, of course, they could look at next paper journey. We'll go back to that. And because there are so many things to learn about paper, we thought with the digital world that paper would go away. But actually, paper is in so many ways a living material because it decomposes and it's used in so many different consistencies. Pardon me, there are actually um, innovative companies linked under the explore links that build complete set of furniture all out of cardboard. You can order it. So these ideas of again showing the real world applications and then looking at artists who make paper, looking at the paper process, 
looking at whether making paper is sustainability or conserving your paper use and so on and so forth. And folding. So I'm going to back up to this piece of paper because it's pretty interesting. Do you want to talk about that, Melissa, uh, before we go right into the students working on it? Yes, yes, I will. Um, somebody said to me the other day, oh, you know, aren't you cheating by giving people in your workshops this piece of paper which is pre-scored? And I said, well, you know, that's basically because of time. So we want people to be able to achieve an outcome in our workshop. So the piece of paper that we start with is necessarily blank, but it has some lines that are scored into it. So they're not drawn on, on the surface of the paper, but embedded within the, the structure of the paper. And it took me a long time to work with a, a company to actually get this correct. And it's on both sides. And so it, it will determine um, which way you need to fold the paper. Now you could do the project without the score, but this, this score will really allow, particularly somebody asked a question earlier about how young do you, do you work with, what, what age groups, and you could not really work with age groups that, that have little hands if you didn't have scored paper. But it's, a, it, it's just a pattern. You can barely see the, the uh, pattern in the surface of the paper because it's not printed. It's, um, it's actually, oh there we go, thank you. It's, but it's embedded, there's a single unit, which we'll get to later and we'll actually unpack the mathematics of what's going on in this piece of paper. But this is the, the beauty of the project, is that you start with a piece of paper and it seems so simple and you end up with such complexity by your, your math making that it's, just, it's a wonderful personal experience as well as uh, having some pretty important inherent math in the, in the making journey. So I'm going to turn this off. So if you'll just take a quick look, I put an X. Can you notice on the X's that the line is actually a little more raised? And then in this grid line, it's a little, in, um, it's more of a valley. And so that's what I want to show you, that when we have an e-learning journey about folding, that we're going to actually introduce Okay, you can crumple paper and make things. We want people to know that. <laughs> but the actual folding, you will see it's called a mountain fold and it's called a valley fold. And there are several types of folding, such as grids, diagonals, and so on. But here you clearly see the mountain folds. And this is a way of teaching literacy of how to look at the lines and find the ones that are to be raised up and the ones that are to go down. And to practice, this is a PDF uh, printable from Next, and they can just take one piece of eight and a half by 11, and you can, they can fold the mountain fold and the valley fold. It's not reading real clear, but if you look closely, there is a difference there. So this is a um, mountain fold and this is a valley fold and they can practice this really quickly. There are, of course, as Melissa mentioned, many, many types of folds, and the idea is to give the students confidence so that, in fact, they can begin to experiment and create their own types. So you'll see this is typical of, uh, similar to, in a way, of one of the folds that we're going to be using today. So I'm going to let Switch back to Melissa, she's going to explain what's going on and then you'll see these students in a three hour workshop who have no idea what they're going to do come and achieve this. Thanks Linda. So as Linda pointed out on the, the blank sheet earlier, there, there are some specific markings on the glide reflection pattern on the piece of paper that, that is part of the Lumifold project. But what we start with is the single unit the square on the left. And we look at the, the, the lines of symmetry within the square. Now any math teacher will say to you, okay, there's one missing, and there is. And that's missing for a purpose, because that's the way we uh, have explored the mathematics of, of folding this particular single unit square. And I'll explain that later. So the glide reflection, if you look at the, the images on the right hand side, um, uh, let's start with the sphere. 
the greyed out single area or single unit area is identified there in the middle and you will see that if you translate or uh, actually will, will reflect first over the horizontal axis and then translate, so moving the single unit along by 0.5, you, if you look at the arrows you will see that the glide reflection shifts over by half. Now that is in one uh, orientation of the, the pattern. If we look at the cylinder, we can see what's different is that it's the same reflection, it's the same glide, but it's rotated by 90 degrees. And that's really important in this, in this project because the outcome of the pattern folding for both the sphere and the cylinder, and we call them the loomy tool and the loomy ball, the, the outcome of these is structurally completely different. They have a completely different uh, integrity um, and structural strength, which you'll see later on. And that's the beauty of what happens when you're making um, from paper in this project, and that's the experience that we want students to have, and which leads to a much greater understanding because they're actually doing it themselves and making this themselves. Um, so when we iterate the shape, so we, we're repeating the shape with the glide reflection pattern, it looks like this. If we were to draw on that, that white piece of paper, this is exactly the pattern that would be drawn. This is exactly the pattern that is embedded in, into the piece of paper by embossing by a different technique. So you can see here that uh, there's also, if we could just go back to that slide for one second, Linda. Um, that what, what we like to do when we've, we've got this projected on, on the big screen is say, okay, well, who can see the diamonds and who can see the crosses? Or who can see the zigzags? If you blow your eyes and care to look deeply into this, this uh, iterative pattern, you'll see many, many different geometric shapes. And with younger students, in fact, with all students um, and with all people of all ages, it's really, really cool to get a bit of a hands up, take, take a bit of you know, data collection on who can see what in this particular pattern. Because our minds are naturally geared towards recognizing patterns and um, as I understand, uh, in cognitive development, um, your pattern recognition actually grows as you grow older. So uh, it would be an interesting um, research topic for me to see, okay, who, at what age does the person see the diamond? At what age does the person see more of the zigzags as Linda is growing, uh, drawing, sorry, or, or at what age does somebody uh, transform or um, translate all of those uh, the three or the four or the five things that you can see in this pattern just going from one to the other just by a different kind of cognitive ability. I would say that's probably somebody that's a, a little older than, than a child anyway. So that's a really interesting kind of way to engage people with this pattern before you actually start to fold it. So thanks for drawing those on, that's wonderful. Now this is where the, the inherent mathematics gets really interesting. So this again is the single unit and the way that we translate this um, piece, if this was just a single piece of paper, to, from being flat to form, so going from two dimensions to three dimensional shape, um, is because of those internal symmetries. So at the point, that, so the boundaries, if we're going to re read this, I'll get this right for you. The basic shape um, boundaries, together with those internal, internal symmetries, um, are the fold lines. Now, Linda was talking about valleys and hills before. In um, all origamists or all um, uh, architectural folders, we'll understand that a green line indicates, um, oh, it indicates, sorry, a valley, and the red lines will indicate a hill. So that's pointing up or pointing down or folding up, folding down. If we're looking at the entire um, uh, section in the middle of this shape, those internal symmetries of that basic 2D shape create the possibilities of the form because at the point of intersection in the middle of that square is where you will get a peak or you'll get a trough. So the choice of those internal symmetries and the, the glide reflection will ultimately uh, form that strength of the end product being um, very flexible or very, very sturdy. So those are important. And if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll let you know why those are important. 
So the nature of this form, actually no, go back, go back one please. There we go. These meeting at a point in the internal, in the, the, the centre of the square, um, it's important that the number of those um, intersections are even, okay? So the total number must be even, the total number of lines are even. The number of valleys and hills must differ by two. So if we look at this square, we have two uh, valleys, okay, and we have one hill at that point of intersection in the middle of the square. So that, that's the difference. And the choice between those numbers will determine, if we go to the next slide, whether the shape is forming up or down. So we could choose two valleys, one hill, or we could choose two hills, one valley. Now at this point in our presentation, we like to say to, to uh, students well, of all ages, so what do you see? How do we know that this is, this is pointing up on the left and pointing down on the right? And basically, that's just another journey that we could take. And there are many journeys that this particular project can lead to, but that one could be in, in light and light and the way it reflects and the way that it, is, it can create an illusion. But for this, it's just an indication of whether your, your uh, glide reflection pattern is pointing up or pointing down. Let's move on. And this is where we, we, we introduce uh, the workshop and I think Linda would like to talk a little bit about the time frame that we have here and what the students are actually doing now, which is also a, um, another part of the making activity. I really liked this part, Melissa, because they've just come off the school bus, they've come up to the 12th floor, they're in the room, they've all got their name tags on, they get their, we've given them our little spiel, a little shorter than what we've just shared with you. And they get to choose their paper. They're not really sure what a sphere or a cylinder is, but then we ask them to um, pretty much um, own it, which means they get to decorate it. And we gave them some colored markers and some pens. Um, and Melissa taught me this uh, technique. I mean, obviously the color that you can do any kind of decoration you want, but you can also pierce the paper. You can see here, finding the diamonds. And this student is pinning or actually creating a pattern with the holes that you'll see will actually be revealed near the end. So this stage is really important. I think we only gave them 15 or 20 minutes, but it's because it connects them with the piece of paper that they are about to be challenged by. And so here they are, and they're beginning the folding process. I'm going to switch it back to you, Melissa. Okay, that's, I like what Linda said just then about connecting the, the participant with the piece of paper. I'm, I'm going to take that one, Linda, thank you. Um, it, it is all about connection. It's about making cognitive connections as well as um, making connections with, with your uh, uh, manual dexterity. When students start to, to um, customise paper by colouring or by uh, making holes with pins or any other device, it does actually give the ownership of that, that paper a little bit more significance. When they start to fold the paper, we, we have to be careful if actually just backing, track, back, going backwards for a moment. If students do too much um, pinning along the lines of folding, um, then the folds will actually end up being a little bit of a, a tear, so we like a perforation. So we do encourage the pattern making to be within um, the areas that aren't embossed or aren't scored for folding, and in that way we don't end up with too many holes. But for the folding, there is a, a systematic approach. We fold on one side all of the long horizontal lines in one direction. And we also fold the shorter, um, let's call these the perpendicular di uh, lines, in the same direction. And that is a little bit counterintuitive for most um, people and of all ages because typically people are used to folding in a concertina type fashion. So they're going to be making like a Chinese fan or just in a zigzag type arrangement. So with, with this project we're actually requiring people to fold in a way that they uh, don't get or they don't understand. It's like the paper will fight with you as you fold. 
when the long lines have been folded in the one direction, forming a grid, then we use in the same direction, sorry, in the same orientation with the same side facing up, we fold all of the little peaks or all of the little diagonal lines within that single unit into a hill. So those are going in the opposite direction to the long lines. And that's where you really need to your hand-eye coordination and your understanding of what you're doing to be really kind of switched on at this time because we're not folding diagonals the whole way through the paper, which would naturally be what you want to do. We are stopping. We're stopping within the single unit square. So it's a whole bunch of little pinch folds. And that's important to actually monitor as you run one of these workshops or as you, you're participating in the workshop because the glide reflection pattern is dependent on your pinch folding within the single unit. If that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Shall I go and back to I you think it's, Yeah, it's great because if you see the pictures with the diamonds on the top, it's starting to curl up, right? And this one's starting to curl up, but that's because the grid has been folded. The grid in both directions curls the paper up. So you can see it curling a couple places. But this young man is starting the diagonal pieces, and Melissa has taught us the, um, the skill of using the edge of a table, and it really is helpful. There was a girl at the end down here who just whipped through these diagonals <laughs> faster than flash. It was like she could see them where other students are struggling to see where one ends and the other begins. So now you can really see that the paper is curling up, right? That's a good piece of paper curling, but it's a paper that really doesn't have the diagonal started. And I'm going to let Melissa come back because these are starting to be some of the finished shapes, but I want you to know that all this decorating and folding took us up to about 11.15. And the instructor, this is one of the instructors who's also working on his own, and there was another one, said, what time should we call for the bus to come pick them up? And we had said 12.30, and we thought, well, first we thought maybe 12.15, we're going so fast. And then Melissa will tell you, but look at these pieces of paper without students. <laughs> these are pieces of paper that actually this woman has put aside because she's frustrated with it. She's got one down here that's almost done, if you can see little mountain and valleys. So I'm going to let Melissa, you take it from here. Thanks, Linda. Yes, there is, a, there is a point in this project where you think, oh, goodness, they're amazing. Everybody's just getting it, and they're all powering through the folding. And then there becomes a point which um, Linda quite rightly called the pinch point as well. And this is where you really need to engage with that glide reflection pattern to see what you're actually dealing with in your folding. And often I'll be assisting uh, participants and saying, now, now, now can you see here, this one needs to go down, this, this one needs to go up in, in, for the particular lines. And they will be saying, yes, yes, I see. And I'll, I'll intuitively know that they're being incredibly polite and I'll say, can you see the pattern? And they say, yes, I can see it. And I say, can you really see the pattern? And they go, no, I can't see the pattern <laughs> because it's really, it's really tricky. And so there are several points in the, in the process where your, your mind actually it, it almost refuses to, to cooperate with what your hands need to be doing. But once those two things work together, and this is where I think, you know, the, the mathematics of, and the biomimetic aspect of this project come to their fore because it's, it's about a pattern recognition and an understanding that, oh, of course, this will fold into that. That fits perfectly. This is absolutely the most natural process. But this is tough. This is, this is where brains hurt trying to see how to do it and where that hand and eye coordination is really essential and how to um, overcome your frustrations as well. Um, and so when I've run these projects and I've run lots of them, I like to look around and sort of use them also as a bit of a social experiment because there's a wonderful sense of achievement that you, that you get to, as you can see in some of these photographs, where, where all of the pieces are folded correctly. And yet there's a point where uh, you, you necessarily have to guide people through that frustration 
and allow them to then take the paper back. So I will get them through the pinch point, or Linda or one of my volunteers will get them through the pinch point and then give the paper back because it's essential that the participants themselves feel that they can uh, construct this um, to the finished product. And, and it's tough. And so, yeah, we, we went right right to the line. I think we were nearly going to miss the bus, Linda. But as you'll see, everybody is engaged in this photo. <laughs> And that's right, because you'll notice here's the girl with the folded paper, but hasn't really gotten it into this mountain valley um, compression, which is really the middle stage. And this is where they start really feeling frustrated because they see here's a woman almost completely done, and she's ready to glue it and make the sphere. And so there becomes this collapse and panic with the students. But if you, as you can see Melissa here, she's really showing how this can actually then fit together. And you can start to see now mountain and valley folds. Um, and it, it kind of just reveals itself in this geometric um, pattern. And they see it. All of a sudden, they see it. So it's really an amazing process here you see the uh, mountain and valley where the paper's been completely compressed. And this is before it's actually turned then into the sphere or the cylinder. That's true. I might just, just have a, a few things to say there too. I think when you have lots of examples and you see, you can see where you're headed, it allows you to, to understand what we're talking about when you talk about the mountain range. And that's what you're heading towards, this mountain range. The image in the middle is very indicative of what that looks like. And then, of course, once the students achieve that aspect, glue their, their um, cylinders or spheres together, there's another amazing um, uh, illuminating moment when we put the light inside of them. And you'll see that the, the blue globe, the blue LED on the left, is actually shining through the, the Lumitol, which is the cylinder shape. And this is an incredibly strong shape. I think coming up later, I've got I've got an indicator of how what the difference is between the ball and the tall, um, and they are they are actually adhered or glued together in a different process as well for to keep their structure sound. Um, the little LEDs are on the right are uh, just little submersibles that that you can get from um, from a dollar shop and things like that. Oh, here we go. If the the little girls are showing. The difference in the, the shapes that you can create with the Lumifold project that have come from this glide reflection pattern. So this is where the journey really, really takes hold and is, is, is it comes to its fruition. Um, the cylindrical shape is incredibly strong. It has massive amounts of uh, stability. And that's because we've cut the, the, the horizontals. So if those horizontals were not those horizontal lines were not actually glide reflected or translated down, then the whole thing would collapse. But because of the rotation by 90 degrees for the loony ball or the spherical shape, um, it means that we do have flexibility. So in fact, you can squash your little uh, loony ball right down to being a sphere or more of a, a, an ovoid or a, looks a little bit like a pickle sometimes or a gherkin, the other shape. That, that, so that is incredibly flexible, somewhat like a puffer fish or a pod, a seed pod, or an item from the sea or an organism from, from the ocean, that sort of thing. So this is where we can relate the whole project back to biomimicry, and it's just wonderful. These, these are images of the, the structures without light, and these ones, this is where we can see you know, the, the artistic uh, relevance of adding color at this point to to the project. Um, Linda, would you like to talk about that? Sure. Um, here were the last two, I'm backing up a minute, but here were the last two to finally get done. And they were really about ready to throw the towel in. So you can begin to see she actually has created the pattern early on without really knowing. Um, so you can see the kind of um, glide translation. And here he has also, in the dark, you'll begin to see that um, there will be pinpoints. Um, here is the person finishing with the uh, fold and about. And 
actually they are so excited to be in a dark room and turn the lights off. And actually this is Melissa's favorite part, so you have to talk about it, Melissa. Okay, thanks, Linda. It is my favorite part, and it's usually at like a slow reveal. I don't really tell anyone about, about what's going to happen at the end, um, but we necessarily, because we've just all made a lamp, we, we go into a dark space or the dar a darkened room if we can find one, and we turn the lamps on, and then I ask participants to look up, and what we've created on the ceiling is a, a constellation of beautiful stars, all different star shapes, uh, depending on the you know, the structure of your folding. And in that way, this project can then be taken further. Um, I have some indicators um, that I, I think are on, on my website, which are and, and probably on Next as well, but necessarily we will provide these. Where This can be taken into an art uh, or a scientific color theory um, lesson. You can take the, the constellations and move them around the ceiling to, to look at um, uh, stars and patterns in the sky. Um, you can start to make all, uh, a number of other geometric shapes. Um, you can go back and talk about the math. You can talk about architecture. You can talk about applications to different contexts for this project. It's, it's not just uh, making a paper lamp is what I'd like to say. Um, oh, here's some really, really, like, if we go back to some of those um, those testimonials, I think that the there was one, this one, the second one, where you turn something ordinary into it, the extraordinary is what happens at that moment when people look up to the ceiling. They've created out of a flat piece of paper this beautiful structure which then emits light, uh, which has another um, particular type of, uh, I guess, joy associated with the activity. Um, back to you, Linda. Okay, this is, this is me, I'm back on. Um, the, the project the project is called Lumifold, and um, there, we, we have a website where you can access resources to, to run something like this in your school or in your library or in your with your makerspace or at home. Um, so uh, those will be posted up a little bit later. Um, Steampop dot, dot zone is where you can access um, all of the instructions, uh, video tutorials, and uh, some syllabus links. This is uh, a work in progress, so we will be adding more to steampop.zone as the project takes off. Um, I'd love to come back and do some more work with Linda um, and do some more, more um, resource building for Next. That would be wonderful. But at this point, this is where you can find me and you can email me from, um, there's an email link, a contact for on Steampop. So I think we need to go and uh, talk a little bit about Next now. So I'm signing off. Yes, no, it's perfect. It's really about blurring learning with work, play, and fun, and getting students excited about what they're doing, because it's the most motivational, uh, we know, addicting thing to want to learn more. So thank you, Melissa, for sharing um, Lumifold, which is an amazing, wonderful, accessible, usable, um, platform and that has the materials that people will need and next now is you know partnering and sharing these uh, journeys and we'd love to see students upload activities to their um, website. We also think that it's important for teacher professional development in most integrated learning, STEAM learning, that it helps for students or for teachers who haven't really been schooled in that cat way to look across skill, um, traditional scales and look across traditional subjects. You can find these pictures on Next Flickr website with the albums of the different workshops that they uh, we have done introducing STEM and our different research in the neuroscience of learning. So both Melissa and I want to thank you and hope that you will start your paper folding right away. Okay. I, I, have a, I, have a way, I have a way for some of the Australians to start that right away, Linda, if that's okay. Um, Absolutely. I'm, um, um, next, next week in uh, the Asia Pacific Architecture Forum is taking place in Brisbane in Australia. And we have three workshops running uh, at that forum. So if you're in, in that area, it would be really wonderful 
to have a look at that. Um, I should get the, the link if someone wants to have a look. I can, I can put this up in the chat later. That's the a Asia Pacific Architecture Forum. And and we've been very lucky to be involved with uh, Vivid, which is a, an illumination festival in Sydney in May and uh, early, uh, late May, early June. There's a teacher professional development session running there for Lumifold, as well as um, a, a family day. So, um, uh, of course, I will be sort of spreading the word about those, and we've been working very hard to. To, to be part of these festivals and I'm, I'm really glad to that I'm going um, beyond and this is a global collaboration now because that, it's, a, it's a really beautiful project that I'm so happy to have brought uh, together with Next and with Linda. So thank you so much for inviting me to talk with you today. All right. Um, we are done and I think you can go ahead, Ness or Coach Cheryl. Thank you very much, Linda and Melissa. That was brilliant. If you're able to, you might want to give them a round of a virtual applause by finding your little smiley face and clicking on the applause icon. Um, that was very, very interesting. It was brilliant to be able to see the process that you went through. And I know that when I've done folding activities with students, it can be a challenge. So I really like the idea of pre-scored paper. It is brilliant. Um, the the thinking and, and the processes that have to go into what you were doing in those workshops are just amazing and really stretch your not only your thinking and your skills but also your resilience and, and, and things like that so you're not giving up. So once again, thank you very much. It was a brilliant session. Uh, I'll close the recording now if there are no more questions. Um, and if so, we can even answer those a little bit later on. So thank you very much, ladies. That was brilliant.